everything. Um, you see sort of it impacting us as consumers, as users, changing our life. Uh, and for businesses, we think in the next 10, 15 years, um, all aspects of, of business will be data driven. They, they will be radically transformed with the use of data. And, and we've been engaged uh, uh, over the last few months with a number of organizations that, that are either city or, or government or trying to do social good. Uh, last week, many of you came to our Saving the Oceans event in San Francisco Bay Aquarium. So, so, so kind of what uh, IBM would call smart planet. What, what is the hive? So, so hive is really um, a cross between venture capital and incubation. We are a set of operating individuals like uh, Lance, Lance who is right there, our CTO, and a number of others <coughs> who work very closely with uh, entrepreneurs, with founders to, to help take their companies from concept, help go from concept to company. And then we, we tend to fund these companies, typically a million and a half to three million dollars. And then they, we work closely with them till they go to launch and across different areas, across technology, go to market, business, and, and so on. We have offices in Santa Monica and, and Palo Alto. And our focus is on applications. So we ourselves don't fund companies that are going to be the going to kill MongoDB or kill Hadoop or something like that. We, we are basically either functional applications, CRM, IT, finance, supply chain, uh, or vertical applications, healthcare, energy. Uh, uh, you'll hear probably about sort of industrial controls, telecom, so vertical applications. So that's who we are. Um, for, for tonight, I encourage you to uh, also join in the conversation on Twitter. Our hashtag is Hive Data, and and our link, our uh, handle is is also Hive Data. Also join us on on Facebook or or LinkedIn if you want sort of more recent information. What human values make data valuable? I'm I'm really pleased to introduce Peter Hirschberg, and uh, and later I'll, I'll come back and introduce Juliet Benton. Uh, Peter is someone we've known for a while. He has led emerging media and technology companies at the center of disruptive changes for more than 25 years. He's the chairman of Reimagine Group, which shapes strategies at the confluence of people, places, brands, and cities. He's, he's co-founder chairman of San Francisco's Gray Area Foundation for the Arts, where he's led initiatives at the forefront of citizen engagement in smart cities, open data, and digital art. These include San Francisco's Summer of Smart Civic Hackathon series with 16 mayoral candidates and urban prototyping initiatives in Singapore, London, San Francisco, Geneva, and Zurich. As advisor to the UN Global Pulse Project, he's addressed the UN General Assembly on real-time data for international development. He is co-curator of the Art of Data and the exhibition and conference at the Aspen Ideas Festival 2013. Peter is also an operating uh, individual. Uh, he is founder and CEO of Elemental Software, served as president and CEO of Gloss.com, uh, former chairman of Technoraki, which many of you know, and spent a number of years at Apple Computer, where he headed enterprise marketing. He's a senior fellow at the USC Annenberg Center of Communication Leadership and a Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute. Peter is a frequent technology and media industry speaker, having presented at TED, the World Economic Forum, DLD, uh, the Entertainment EG, the Entertainment Gathering, Aspen Ideas Festival, and, and so on. Uh, I'd like to welcome Peter Hirschberg. Thanks.
Okay, can everybody see that? We'll get started. Well, uh, thanks. The, the topic tonight is really human values in the big data society. And this really comes about because we're changing things so quickly that we're rubbing up against how we govern ourselves, what we think of ourselves, and what we do about that. And it's kind of in the news every day now. It didn't used to be, but certainly ever since the Snowden affair, it's, it's headlines every day. You can pick all sorts of founding moments when the world changed because of big data, but uh, my favorite is September 7, 2006. Something unique happened in the human experience that day, and it was happened to be the day that Rome won the World Cup, and about three quarters of a billion people watched on TV. But what was really interesting that day is it was the day that MIT and Telecom Italia grabbed live texting and cell phone data and started painting a visualization of what it was like when the crowd was celebrating and hanging out. It was the first time we were using this always on present cell data to paint a picture of us. It was the beginning of all the metadata that's now hugely in the news because it's what the NSA uses and it's the basis of the latest chips from Apple and from Google. This is kind of what it looked like. It was the end of normal time, 15 minutes overtime happens, then there's a second 15 minute overtime and Zidane gets the red card, and then eventually everybody goes crazy. And what you're seeing is who's texting where in Rome. You're getting a kind of a sentient sense of what's going on in the city. Now, this stuff has become very common in visualization since then, but it was the beginning of realizing that we're putting out signals that are really part of our digital identity. That was only six years ago, and yet that moment and all of the rich sensors and real-time data that have flowed since then are kind of defining the world that we're living in. We're producing signals, of course, that have unprecedented ability to give us insight into our behavior and our economics and our health and our well-being. And the numbers, of course, are, are staggering. Uh, today, there'll be more internet searches than people on Earth. About a billion times a day, people publish something to a blog or a social network. Of course, all of these are signals of our intentions and sentiments, things that social scientists couldn't have dreamed of a decade ago. Uh, but something else is also happening, which is as we're doing all of this, we're building almost perfect digital representations of ourselves. Um, as we go along through life, there's this kind of digital companion that's keeping track of where we are, how we're behaving, you know, based on reading that data, are we going outside and having to smoke where we are? It's something that can't be turned off, and that's kind of a change in the human condition, in the sense that there's this other thing that has all of the information about me. And that's incredibly useful because that's the thing that's useful in quantified health. It's the thing that's very useful in the medical profession. Of course, that's the same thing that, that, that can be used for marketing purposes. And, and where that stacks up against kind of what our notion of ourselves and property looks like is kind of a really new concept. Um, and, and it's all very cell phone based, I think, as kind of the core piece of machinery before we move on to kind of the rest of the Internet of Things. There's about 5 billion cell phones on the planet. About four billion of those are in developing countries. So, so it'd be about 10 billion text messages a day. So one thing to realize is this is not just kind of a Western or Northern phenomenon. It, it literally is, is very global. And everybody's interested in this stuff. So it's clearly, you know, there, there, there are laws in the California legislature now, federal law. Uh, I, I mentioned, or in introducing me, uh, Robbie mentioned that, that I spoke at the UN. There was real concern there on literally how does the UN keep up. This was about two years ago, and the, the challenge was that the rest of the world was using big data to kind of understand itself. And the international development community wasn't, and kind of the way we put it is, if we can finally figure out what advertising works and what media is effective, wouldn't it be great if we did that for things like international development and targeting food aid or targeting disaster relief. So this is kind of like a consciousness raising at the UN and how to apply all of that stuff. So that's what a number of these slides are from. Uh, and this is, but, but of course this applies whether you look at marketing or government or any of these things. I'm gonna look today at some of the values-based things and how we make decisions with a little eye more towards the public sector. Of course, one thing to realize is that this is really the century of social sciences. If you think about the 20th century, was the century of physical sciences. We kind of figured out how physics worked, Einstein very early in the century, sorted out relativity, and all sorts of stuff was built uh, kind of right on through all of electronics, nuclear technology. And then 
we started measuring our planet and instrumenting things in ways that we could never imagine. And that's what makes this, this kind of the, the, the century of social sciences. Actually, if you go back to about the 1860s, Garfield, who later became president, but was in Congress at the time, when the US Census came around, kind of rose up and said to the Congress, this will be our first measured century. We used to tell history through kings and, and wars, but now we'll have statistics and we'll understand what the world looks like. Uh, he was then assassinated, but he presaged the era of big data by about 100 years. Um, one of the most interesting projects in the space, actually many of my favorite projects in the space are done by the MIT Sensible Cities Lab. And one of my favorite was done by Francisca Roja, who uh, worked with AT&T to get data from who was calling who from New York. So this was IP and telephone data, visualized here by Aaron Koble, and this was shown in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Again, one of the first views of how we're all connected around the world. In addition to this piece being beautiful, when you actually looked at the data, you started learning a great deal about people in the aggregate. So uh, one thing you can measure is for each neighborhood in New York, who do they talk to around the world? So New York really is a diaspora, but you can quantify it. So the kind of things that you used to take a census to do or a lot of research just by looking at the call data, the call pairs, you could find out what was going on. One of the interesting results was the surprising thing is who do New Yorkers call the most? You might think London or Tel Aviv or Tokyo, but no. It was mostly a north-south issue. New Yorkers were calling the Caribbean and Mexico because it turns out with the decrease in cost of technology, parents were literally raising their kids overseas. Moms would be in New York, kids would be at home, and those connections are made every day. And this is literally kind of just from cell phone data. One of the best researchers in the world in this arena is Nathan Eagle. MIT and Harvard scientist, and um, he had access to kind of cell phone data oh, really before lots of other people did. Did a bunch of research on it, and uh, I, I still think kind of has a lot of leading stuff. I was talking to him a couple of years ago, and this is kind of how he positioned kind of what it's like to get inside of that information. Oops. Let's try When, we, when I typically give talks and tell people, oh, I study data coming from mobile phones, people immediately think, oh, well, this must be just like a social network of who calls who. But in reality, uh, mobile phones are far more than just two-way communication devices. Mobile phones are mechanisms to track people's location, track people's movement, be able to start quantifying consumption patterns, um, being able to start understanding economic relationships between individuals. Uh, so the data coming from uh, a mobile phone specifically is, is one that is incredibly multidimensional. Um, and the type of data and the type of insights that you can glean from it, um, I'm looking at the the expert right now. Kind of living in Northern California, we're familiar with a lot of the marketing and location and one of my cell apps. Here's some of the kind of other things that the rest of the world does with it. Economic signals is really interesting. Um, if you want to figure out how a population is doing, it turns out the way that they top up cell phones tells you a lot. So let's say that both of us buy $10 a month of cell phone and you know, we top it up. If I go from paying $10 all at once to a dollar 10 times, that's probably indicative of a cash flow problem. If you do this at scale, so across a few million people, say in Rwanda, what you would find is that uh, you can now see, is, 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 an, is a population crashing in a particular village? You have people going below the poverty line. And you can never see this stuff before. Uh, and, and this is done because what you do is you do real social science research and you find out kind of how, what families are, are making. Then you kind of correlate that with the cell phone stuff. And you can get kind of counterintuitive results. So here you can see there's a sliding scale of that. Um, one of the interesting results is, you know, are slums bad? So the biggest slum in the world is in Kibera. And, uh, and, and you know the assumptions where people are coming out of, of the range, going into it, and it's bad because they're going into a slum. But if you actually look at the cell phone behavior, you see they're improving their economic lots. So it raises an interesting question that a dense city is actually a wealth creator. And if you're if you're actually trying to solve problems, the fact that you suddenly see all of this is kind of things that never existed before. Um, the health information inside of cell phones, in terms of just for a population at large. 
is also really interesting. One of the top researchers in that arena is Sandy Pedlum at MIT. It seems that a lot of this stuff kind of goes up to, to his lab, and I think some of those interesting stuff's come out. Um, you may remember there was a, a SARS epidemic a while ago, and the question is, well, how would you find out in general in public health, by the time people report things, it's too late. So here Sandy's talking a bit about how that data can be used for really interesting public good purposes. And of course, beneath all of this, the same information that can solve great problems is really the same stuff that we're worried that the NSA is looking over, and it's the same stuff that marketers use. So you have this interesting kind of the fundamental dilemma is this is incredibly powerful, useful stuff. We have a whole conversation going on about how we're freaked out about it. We have other people who may be abusing it, you know, kind of irresponsible marketers. And at the same time, it can do great good. And how do we resolve that? And are we even having this discussion? So one of the reasons I think it's interesting to point all the good that can be done out is sometimes in a heated discussion, this side of the story doesn't get it's due. Now, we, we go around and realize it. We have some sense of what's around us, but we don't have the big picture. By aggregating and averaging this data, though, you can do things like you can tell, well, are the people in this city block healthy? And let's think about Hong Kong and SARS. Well, at one point, suddenly, everybody in the apartment building got sick and didn't go to work. And nobody noticed that for a couple of weeks, actually. Uh, but if you were aggregating this data, that would have stood out like that. Um, and it, it turns out that this kind of markers, so I do a bunch of work with cities, and the, kind of the most amazing thing is to kind of pull this stuff up and then find out what it tells you about the DNA of a place. And it's worked in, in many ways, what we're doing in North America, we learn from developing countries because they have bigger problems and then we have to deal with resiliency later. So a really interesting example of that was uh, when Haiti had its earthquake, uh, a bunch of work was done very quickly to rebuild the roads and to use uh, satellite data and cell data to begin to get a sense for where the roads were missing and direct people to do it. So a lot of infrastructure was put in place. When the cholera epidemic broke out a few months later, people were tuned into real-time data. and. You can immediately see when the cholera outbreak happened, which is the black area, people dispersed to the red area. It was the first time in history people knew exactly where the disease was going to go, because you knew where all the people were going to go. And that's because the aid workers had kind of learned this particular technique. Um, in many cases, this kind of real-time data challenges authorities. So you may remember there was an outbreak of E. coli in Germany two years ago. And if you were the federal government in Germany, what you would do is the e. coli outbreak. Then people would get sick, then they go to the hospital, then eventually they get reported to you. Then people started dying, and at this point, the prime minister is screaming at you, the public health minister, to do something about this. And your resources are the little data from the hospital and then whoever you're working with. And they unfortunately made a bad call. They decided to blame cucumbers from Spain. Turns out it was not cucumbers from Spain. Meanwhile, a startup here in Northern California called Epidemic IQ was tuning into social data from around the world. And what they found looking at the social data, and, and here you can see, so this is, these are blog posts and tweets and kind of anything discussing the disease with the outbreak, with the geolocation. And you'll notice very quickly, it sure looks like it starts in Northern Germany. And if you look at the bottom of the graph, the red line is what the government is hearing from its official sources. And the green stuff is all of the social information, which basically shows that they were able to pick up the epidemic about two weeks before everybody else predicted. Now, when we presented this at the United Nations, I had a problem. I was in front of the General Assembly and all these countries were there. And, and I could not get up like this American guy and say, and you, Germany, screwed up. That would be impolitic. Fortunately, co-presenting with me was Andreas Weigand, who used to be the chief scientist from Amazon, and a German citizen. So Andreas was able to get up and say, well, we in Germany were a little bit too top down on this one, and the bottom up signals were much more important. Uh, and that shows something about decision making, right? Just as in the corporate world and in the media world, people had to make peace with the fact that the audience was speaking and social media was happening, so too in government you find now that kind of functions that are very formal and top down like public health are hugely augmented and kind of change the power structure 
and, and, and this new data has to be admitted. It also kind of challenges notions of openness. Um, public health people used to think, well, we can't possibly share all of our data with people. They might freak out or you know, have a panic, so we will figure it all out and then tell them when we have the answer, you know, which is kind of like, and the news will write all the news and the audience will just consume it. And so that, that same thing is kind of going on in the public health world. Of course, the stuff can be even more interesting and invasive and deeper than that. Um, ambient cell phone data can now predict, for example, if you're depressed. It turns out uh, if, if you're depressed, you behave differently, you get up at different times. And at scale, you can look at that and, 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 and sense information. And that is what a startup was doing, but it also turns out to be of real use to the US military when you have people coming back from Afghanistan. And at scale, the question is they're depressed and some may be suicidal. Here's, Sand, here's a, a John Clippinger, who works with Sandy Pentland, is a good friend. Uh, he and I have worked together on kind of a number of these World Economic Forum kind of data privacy issues. So here's John describing once they realized they could predict people's mental health from a cell phone, what happened next? That led to another project funded by DARPA that we're doing uh, with returning veterans from uh, the Iraq War who have post traumatic stress disorder. And there we can monitor their interaction and behaviors to assess an onset of depression and then notify friends in their own network. And this proves to be more effective than more traditional measures. Uh, and then there may be kinds of interventions by friends that actually ameliorate the depression. You can imagine all the values issues this brings up. So there's nothing more practical than that. And the decision to go see issue, and the stigma see issue. Well now, in an ambient basis, the same way we can figure out, like, did you go for a good run today? We actually know, I mean, if you should think about what a cell phone knows, we know if you're a smoker because of you work in this office and you go outside five times a day, 10 feet away, that's about, you know, about the only reason you do it is to go out and have a smoke come back. In this case, we can figure out if, if, you're, if you're depressed or not. So in general, we're able to find all sorts of really interesting patterns in the world. And especially when you deal with public health things, it, it raises a whole set of issues. Um, and of course, it can also, one thing you find is it highlights huge inefficiencies and areas of society that need reform. And, and the minute you start highlighting and sunshining these things, you know, you have this issue of, is some part of the government or some function bad? Should they be changed, right? The minute light shines on you, what is an experiment and improvement to one person looks like you're not doing your job to another. Um, one of the most interesting examples of this was done by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brenner in Camden. I don't know if any of you have seen the frontline piece, Dr. Hotspot on him, New Yorker also had a piece. This was a doctor who lived in Camden. Camden's one of the poorest cities in America um, with poor public health and, and uh, very low wages. Uh, and, and, and he was amazed that, you know, he's trying to figure out what do you do about all this? And he started studying the data and he realized that a huge number of uh, all of the um, kind of all of the disease problems came from a very few number of houses, of, of places in, in Camden. Um, they were seeing all sorts of people in hospitals with serious falls more than anywhere else in the country. And they realized that there was a problem with the healthcare delivery system. And without the data, it just looked like a big problem. He suddenly realized very few places were producing most of the problem. Here's what he said. There were hotspots by disease, hotspots by by patient. There were certain patients who'd been over and over and over going to the emergency room and hospital too much. Brenner says the numbers showed that 1% of people living in Camden accounted for 30% of hospital charges. Most of those racked up in the emergency room. So you're compiling all of this information coming from all of the hospitals in the local area. Compiling massive amounts of data. So a full Brenner then turned that raw information into visual information. So this is a map of the city of Camden. And this is looking at cost data. So the red areas are high cost hotspots. These are parts of the community where people who have more than a million dollars in payments to the hospitals live. And this is over a five and a half year period. So here you, you pull out the two most expensive city blocks. Yep. But you found in your community, there are two buildings that, right. that are the most expensive places. That's exactly right. So the uh, building on the bottom, Abigail House, is a nursing home. And the top one, Northgate 2, is an apartment tower with elderly and disabled people. 
$83 million in bills. That's right. Probably more than the cost of the building. <laughs> yes. Yep. It was really obvious in the data that the most expensive people were getting terrible care. And I knew them. So I'd walk in the exam room and say, Mrs. Rodriguez, I haven't seen you in three months. Where you've been? Well, I've been in the ICU for a month and a half. I've been in the hospital for another couple of weeks. And I'd say, well, what happened? And she'd say, well, I'm not really sure. A lot of doctors came in the room. They never really explained anything to me, but I've got this whole bag of medicine. So American healthcare doesn't do a good job taking care of sick people. Brenner's big insight was to use his data to target the sickest and most expensive patients in the city. In 2007, supported by small grants from foundations, he put together his team of medical hotspotters. Hey, Andrea, it's Kathy Jackson giving you a call from the coalition. I was wondering if you had a chance to do your blood glucose logs. The most visible part of the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers are these nurses, social workers, and medical assistants. So we've seen some preliminary results uh, of 40 to 50 percent reductions in visits uh, and cost. Uh, we're now 40 to 50 percent reduction in cost. In cost and visits. You know, one of the amazing things about when you apply big data kind of any domain, the initial efficiencies you pick up are often more than 10 percent. So he saw a 40 percent efficiency here. But it kind of in any process, the amount of just latent inefficiency because that process was not telling us all about itself is, is staggering. And it turns out in something as inefficient as public health where you just haven't been measuring it, found a lot. Now, the, because the problem in any of these cases is once you figure it out, there's a lot of behavior change. To do. So you can, you can understand how a system works. Now, going through and actually changing how things are funded and, and how care is given is tough. And that's what he then put all of his time into. He realized if you actually put anticipatory care or clinics in these very expensive buildings, people wouldn't keep going to the hospital because they had some chronic diabetes thing that actually be treated better and costs went way down. And his, of course, the, the punchline is if you can do that in a place like Hamden, can you do that for the whole country? And as we're seeing with the healthcare legislation now making the system level change is a very difficult kind of thing, and yet being pioneered in, in a place like Camden. What you learn from data culture is, is everything gets turned into an experiment. Um, uh, he put all this stuff under a microscope, he understood what was going on, and, and then it turned into, a, turned into an experiment. And uh, uh, you know what you realize is, it, it's actually much of what we learn in Silicon Valley, you keep doing this minimal viable product thing. We've learned something, what can we change, how can we keep iterating? And when you bring that to things like the government or to sectors that haven't had that, you're thinking about a very big culture change because you're challenging people. I was doing a project in Singapore. So we've done a bunch of civic hackathons. We built, like if, you, if you do a project in the United States, you build an app that improves something. So you might be helping firemen respond better or, or, or perhaps solving a food problem or traffic. Generally, cities are like, thank you. We're broke. We appreciate all the free help. Have another hackathon. We're going to buy you pizza. When you go to Asia, and everybody shows up in a culture that's very much about saving face. When a whole bunch of people show up and crowdsource a solution and the bureaucrat hears we're doing it better, that doesn't sound like, thank you, that sounds more like, oh my god, everyone's doing my job. I'm ashamed. So it actually took us kind of several months more in Singapore to figure out like how do you do this? And it was kind of adoption was a lot slower. Uh, same kind of cultural thing. What you tend to find is the culture among developers is the same all over the world, but the people they talk to at night, very, very different. Uh, and this bit about big data turning everything into an experiment is really interesting. Here's John Clippinger again. People talk about big data, and they, and they think about big data as just a lot of data. But actually, the, the key point about big data is, particularly when you use sensor information, you're not dealing with averages. You're able to collect real-time data, not a sample, but a full set, and understand the individual in that data. So you're not dealing with a statistical average and aberration you're actually what that person is. And, and this is very significant in, in medicine because they've had to change protocols around this because they, they were de designing interventions for averages which actually didn't exist. With big data, you can say, ah, this is peer. This is what's appropriate to peer. This isn't peer to 10 other people. So of course, this is a very big cultural thing because we've just been in a couple hundred years in a representative democracy and kind of government looks at averages and marketers looked at averages and of course that's all changing. It's now getting very personalized and targeted whether you're delivering health or you're delivering marketing or you're solving kind of a problem in business. And so 
uh, that that kind of is is a very different way of looking at things because you know when when a new uh, uh, drug is introduced, the FDA has to approve it, and if it only works on ninety five percent of the people, that means five percent is bad for them and may not get approved. Well, if you can actually figure out who it actually works on, you can make a fundamental difference, and that's something we're just getting used to. Um, th this is the case of uh, uh, like in, in, in cancer patients, you. You were lucky if you got into a trial and everybody else was treated at large. Well, now with big data, everybody can be part of a trial because it can get that focused. This changes, of course, the way we look at ourselves. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's kind of the big values issue here. Um, in a way, we've woken up in a digital panopticon. Panopticon was this uh, Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century came up with the idea of an institution like a prison or a hospital where kind of the observer sat in the middle and you could look at everything as kind of a physical version of the God's eye looking at us. But the idea is we're all suddenly looked at, all of our data's out there, and we, that never happened because you know, there was mostly privacy before that. Um, the best analogy that I could think of that sets all this up kind of from a what do you do about it from a policy point of view was my friend Mark Davis at Microsoft. He pointed out that if you go back a few hundred years to feudal times, um, before the Enlightenment, uh, we, we lived in a world where there was a lord who kind of owned the castle. And if you lived there and worked there, you were his property. And, and uh, you didn't really own your body or your domicile. You didn't really have freedom of movement because you were kind of indistinguishable from being his because like there was this big entity that produced food and you were part of it and you were a slave. And the distinction that you actually had your own body and your own rights separate from your economic relationship with him, that didn't happen until the Enlightenment and we kind of had a view of, of, of human rights and self-determination, and it was a very different view of the world. Well, we're about that same stage with data right now, in the sense that uh, the internet gets started, and, you know, Microsoft or Google starts collecting data, and in order to use their service, you have to give them the data, and it all works out, and you figure it's a really good deal, and then you suddenly realize that everyone's collecting data on you, and there's this realization that that's actually the feudal arrangement, the notion that this digital self you own, it's separate, it has a different relationship, you get to call the rules out. That's like um, a new concept. And it wasn't exactly what dot coms had in mind when things got started. And as a legislative idea, it's kind of a new idea. It has its history and property rights. And we're kind of now trying to figure out if that's what's going on conceptually, how do we legislate for it? And then how the devil would you write it in code so you could actually find a way to give everybody access to and calling the shots on their data without spending time all day long in a user interface deciding micro things. Because what happens after feudalism is the Enlightenment. This is where we have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, civil society. This is what then leads to the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and this notion of property rights. So today in the kind of the big debate over privacy, everybody cites the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, no search and seizure, comes from John Locke. His, his realization, the enlightenment, that every man has a property, has property, has right to his own person, no one can take it away. And then James Madison talks about the right to property, but also the property and rights. So all of your human rights and your ability to call your own sh shots in your life, that's your own property. So that, that big distinction is kind of, I think, where we are in the world of data today. Now, what, what do we actually do about it? How do you operationalize it? Um, and how do you meet the conflicting needs of the government for security and what marketers want to do and, uh, uh, and how you express yourself is, becomes a really big issue. And it's a very present real problem. So for example, the World Economic Forum, which is kind of this conclave of companies and governments from around the world that gets together, about three years ago, they got all excited about big data. They, they could have been one of your limited investors. It was like, they wrote this report, it's like, Personal data, the emergence of a new asset class. It's like, this is going to make money for everybody. It's going to be great. Okay. Then, like in the following year, kind of every country starts to worry about privacy legislation. France starts saying, maybe we have the right to for, you know, erase stuff. We have the right to forget. Uh, Germany goes completely ballistic over kind of any of the Google Street View stuff. And it's clear that citizens and policymakers around the world want to clamp down and assert individual people's property rights and become kind of a strong government on this. So the World Economic Forum takes a complete turn. Next year goes, oops, how about we rethink personal data? 
and we make the whole thing the story about strengthening trust. And then they start a development effort that actually starts pitting um, uh, Microsoft on one side with a whole bunch of the tech industry and regulated people against Google and Facebook. Because Google and Facebook are the best examples of deregulated people who do what they want with this stuff. And it turns out if you're a bank or you're a cell phone carrier, you're regulated by the government, you can't play fast and loose, so you actually like there to be more mechanisms and more control in this place. Uh, the European Union starts putting on greater restrictions, and in a way, maybe going too far, because you know, saying that, that no one else has access to the data or you have a right to be forgotten, I mean, how do you, you know, if you're keeping track of stuff, is that even the right thing? It's an example of kind of strong government asserting itself. And now this same World Economic Forum group is kind of working through, is there another way of looking at this other than kind of old physical world property rights? And the person who they're turning to for inspiration is this woman, Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, I think the only woman to have done so. A lot of her work was done on water rights, because water is this common good. Um, we all share, we can't, if we pollute it, that's not very good. It's a different regulatory environment. It has to have boundaries. Uh, it has to have kind of collective choice agreements. So the, the world is beginning to pull from that body of thinking how do we regulate um, or, or work in the world of data. And some of the most interesting stuff that's being done is how do you build technical architectures where you might have control of, of all of your stuff, and if, it's, if there's incredibly valuable marketing insights, instead of your being spam, it's like you're issuing an RFP, or an agent working on your behalf finds people who have collective interests and turns that into an economic entity. And so there's this incredible need to kind of go from legal thinking to actual code to then how do we keep it simple so it's going to be a very fertile time, I think, for, for product development in this space. Meanwhile, we have kind of a lot of legal minds that are just trying to keep up. I love this one in kind of a recent Supreme Court case, um, or actually, there are several of them, but in this case, the judge basically said, you only have a right to privacy if the cell phone is turned off. Of course, this comes out a week before all the cell manufacturers are building low-power chips, and the whole point is off doesn't exist. And actually, if you talk to anybody under like 30 offline as a concept is a very real concept. And so this is, this is his decision in which he basically says all you have to do is, is turn it off. And there are kind of many great examples of this, which is why it, it really takes people in the product development world to come up with kind of interesting approaches here. Meanwhile, uh, while we have this whole bit about um, uh, kind of how all of this data can be used in privacy, the whole other side of the equation has to do with security and the government, which of course is always out to want to use data to protect you. Mm -hmm. um, and this urge to protect you with data, which of course continues with the NSA today, has been around ever since the government gets hands on data. Um, and the first example of that I could find was about 1956. There was a very big problem. Russia might come after us with a nuclear weapon. And the solution was the first huge big data project paid for by the US government. Oh, and that's coming up in a moment. This is just a uh, old RCA 501 pointing out that mm -hmm. as soon as there were computers, men in suits loved them. And here's the first government project from 1958. Mm -hmm. Solve the big problem. This is where America's peace of mind begins. Around the clock, radars, electronic eyes watch the skies and report what they see to SAGE, defense system of the United States Air Force. Here is a SAGE center on 24-hour alert. At its heart is a computer developed by a research team from MIT and IBM working with the Air Force. The SAGE computer speeds the information for decisions by man in our missile age. Strength for national defense. Speed for informed decisions. Service for a growing America. This is IBM. Now the way that was a hell of a project, um, it engaged 20% of all the programmers in our country. Uh, it cost more in real dollars than building the atomic bomb in the first place. Uh, and it was the first real-time data system that financed IBM 360. So it, was a, it, it kind of got on the table, distributed computing, real-time, the first kind of computer pointing device, graphic displays, all in whole cloth. This excited government people everywhere realized with data, they could control people's destinies. And as we know, not all projects pan out. 
For example, in Allende's Chile, in 1971, uh, President Allende came up with CyberSyn. He was convinced that in a centrally planned economy, if they got all the economic data, you could go into a big room like this and control things. The room looked like the Star Trek set. It was popular back then. History records uh, the project was all vaporware. It never actually got built. It wasted millions of dollars. But it showed the great desire to use big data to control things. And this continues to this day. Uh, that same thing that IBM built for the US government, cities can now afford. Their problem isn't nuclear weapons. It's managing their cities. And IBM is very proud that they deployed a very similar thing in Rio last year. I'll show you a clip. Tell me if the architecture looks similar. The heart of the project is found in the control room. It is here that the 70 operators alternate during different shifts to monitor the city's operation. Over 400 cameras installed at strategic points supply images that are viewed on this big screen, the largest in Latin America. The city government invested in the latest technology to forecast the weather and was a pioneer in acquiring a radar for the exclusive purpose of preventing flooding and mudslides. Installed in the neighborhood of Mohu do Soleil, <coughs> this radar can forecast rains that may hit the city. That was great, is same kind of big radar system. This is, this is an example of the top-down use of big data in government, as opposed to kind of the more bottom-up thing. That's kind of what IBM's doing now. There's nothing wrong with top-down, but of course you have to use it correctly. Um, so a little on data and what not to do with it. Um, in the 1960s, coming off of the Cold War, uh, the Rand Corporation figured they could apply then data techniques to cities and governments to solve problems. And they were hired by New York because uh, in New York, they thought they could, New York was in economically awful shape, so they thought maybe if they could close some fire departments, they could save some money. And the research showed, theoretically, through kind of an operations research function, that might work. It turns out, if you don't listen to people and you have bad data, you can cause problems. In this case, they caused one of the boroughs of New York to burn down. The plants look like a war zone. Every day there was a fire. How could city government allow this to happen? Who was in charge? Why? After these cuts, fire damage rates were astronomical. You know what they did is, instead of being really close and having a feedback loop, looking at the data, doing a model and seeing what happens, things were really slow. You wrote a model, you went off to a corner, you told people to cut the fire departments, and without that feedback and without kind of being very close to the market, you made big, big mistakes. And to this day, that's one of the big problems you can make with data. The hero in this story is more recently uh, uh, Mike Flowers, who is the big data guy in New York, who is using his team to actually go prevent fires. So in New York, there are about 2,000 fires a year in one to three family apartments. There are about 20,000 complaints about illegal conversions. And so the question is, who do you go send the inspectors to go look at? Because they only have 200 building inspectors. So it turns out that if you go find what the high order bid is that would predict the fire, you can save a lot of lives. And in his case, it turns out to be people who are defaulting on mortgages, late on payments, aged when the building was done. So he found four or five pieces of data, and he's become the hero. Uh, and for kind of very little money, he's completely redeploying how that resource is used. Uh, and you can see that here. Uh, of course, the moral of that story is, is and this is something that the great designer Charles Eames said, Never dedicate, never delegate understanding. Uh, O'Reilly has a bad data handbook, which includes the following things one should never do. Uh, it's a, or put it in a positive, uh, know nothing about your data, use only one tool for all efforts, do analysis for analysis sakes only, keep it in a silo, and expect omnipotence. Really smart guys like Mike Flowers do the opposite of that. It also turns out that you get conflicting values even when you're trying to solve problems. This comes under part of the talk as I wrap up. Well, that's ironic. Um, in November last year, Hurricane Sandy hit New York and New Jersey. And one of the big problems was a lot of capacity was knocked out. And the government wanted to figure out which gas stations were still open so they could send FEMA trucks there. Now, it turns out this is a real-time problem. and. <clears throat> 
you, you didn't know because the, the, nobody was telling you. So I was actually having lunch that day with the guy who's the White House open data person from the Department of Energy. And I'm like, why don't we use the same AT&T and Verizon data, that same cell phone data that's being used in Africa to go figure out are people sick or to find out the SARS thing? Because if everybody's clustering at a dock, that would be a gas station with a line. And if you know where a gas station is from Google Maps and no one's there, it must be closed because no one's there. That would give you the answer. Okay, so he talks to Secretary Chu, who's at the White House meeting, and they're like, we tried that, but AT&T and Verizon threw their lawyers at us because they said they weren't allowed to share that information for privacy. The irony is it was the same information that they were giving the NSA. <laughs> and it was the same government. So you actually learned that in the case of national security, you could share the information, but in the case of a national emergency, you couldn't. We didn't know that at the time. But we solved the problem resiliently. So I said to him, do you know Waze, the traffic app, which Google has sent for? And he goes, yes. So I wrote an email to my friend who was the community head at Waze, and I said, do you have enough data points in New Jersey to do this thing that the White House needs? And she's like, yeah, that's a really cool idea. So she got the developer on the phone. They pushed this thing to Waze in New Jersey. It's like, is it closed? Tell us what you see. And by 6 at night, they found all the gas stations solving the White House's problem, pointing out some of the irony in kind of all of this metadata stuff, and also, again, proving why if you're a regulated carrier, it's a real pain in the ass compared to actually being able to do experiments. The other moral of the story is the map that got built to show everybody where the gas stations are open were built by a bunch of high school students in Franklin, New Jersey, disadvantaged high school students that were taking a STEM class, and their teacher was teaching them kind of real-time disaster resilient techniques. Before Hurricane Sandy hit, I think the kids thought, oh my god, it's a Adobe math class. When it happened, they, were, they did such a great job that the Department of Energy had to tweet out to their parents, please don't let them go to sleep because we need them to finish the work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, oh, there's the, the tweet. And then eventually the Department of Energy like tweets a big thank you. Final story on this front, which is a value story. So you can see the great good that data does. Here's my friend Rajiv Bhatia. He is the public health guy in San Francisco who uh, um, has used open data to go solve health problems. So he created a healthy communities index. So he took traffic accident data and housing inspection data and basically says this part of town is or isn't healthy. And if it's not healthy, he aims the uh, health department to go solve that problem. That's a really original use of data because he's not just like some analyst. He's using it to go solve a social problem. Here's Rajiv. Over a two or three year period, we tested and evaluated about 300 measures and eventually settled on about 100 measures of a, a, a comprehensive, healthy, equitable, sustainable city. This is, this, this is now called the Sustainable Communities Index. The first time you bring it, there's a fight. It's like, oh my god, you're telling me what to do, or you know, you are anti-development, you're anti-progress, you're a terrorist. You know, I mean, it's like all, all this really you know, hostility. But eventually, what happens is they go, okay, you're right. There is a solution, right? It's not like the world will end. Uh, we can build this project. We've been also successful in looking at particular deficiencies in San Francisco, like where are the air pollution hotspots and where are the traffic injury hotspots, and focusing city attention on those hotspots. We have a map of, uh, of high injury quarters where there's 5% of the city streets that represent 55% of the serious and fatal injuries. So this is an amazing use of data, and it's a great example of uh, you know, solving a problem, meeting public good. The, the, the code to his story is he's actually kind of being run out of office right now, because it turns out when you're solving a problem like this, you piss people off. Uh, he took the restaurant inspection data and fed it into Yelp, and now the restaurant inspectors you see what they're doing all the time. Um, he's kind of stepping on the toes of other departments, and so his management's not so happy with that. Um, so it's kind of led to what, what it's pointed out is you, in this really powerful new open tool, when you're sitting inside of government, sometimes you can step on toes. So it raises a bunch of questions about how these things are used, and I think in coming years we'll raise questions about what is an activist government or not, how are you progressive, but it points out the power of that. Um, I'm just about out of town, so I thought I would end up with a little bit on the art of data, since so much of this stuff is about getting people to understand and become comfortable with this different world where we're all in the middle of it. Uh, uh, 
I've been interested in kind of how artists are interpreting. So there's very literal things like visualizations. This is in uh, Helsinki. This is a power station. And the more power you save, the bigger the indicator. It's like a big joint gain gamification. And uh, uh, it works great. It's kind of the first one of the first public examples of that. Um, you can also use unexpected twists to get at people. Does anybody know this mountain? This is, you're probably familiar with it, that's actually the NASDAQ in 2000, <laughs> rendered as a mountain. For those of you, actually, those, yeah, for those of you who are like, well, that's like too extreme for me, that's the Dow Jones. It's, <laughs> uh, this was the Art of Data exhibit we did in Aspen this summer. Uh, here's work by Luc Dubois, who took simple clustering, so the same kind of clustering stuff that you might do to kind of show uh, a word cloud in a blog, these are speeches from all the presidents, the, the State of the Union, so you can very quickly see what their priorities is. There's George W. Bush, it's pretty clear what his priority is. <laughs> uh, Luke also takes big data, so he, he, he went through every dating site in America, downloaded or stole, open source, however you want to put it, uh, about 13 million records. This is how San Franciscans in their, you know, match.com, how they describe what they're looking for, but, and you'll notice that the number one, and, and each word can only be used by one city, the number one used word in San Francisco as a percentage was gay. Used it more than anybody else. San Jose, architects, because we're all software architects down here. Um, I, I think liberals near Santa Cruz, so it's kind of a great extra. Uh, New York, similar things by neighborhood. I'm running out of time, so I think we'll just, I'll wrap up and show you one other one. Uh, Sometimes, we, sometimes all of this water data rolls over our heads. How do you pay attention? Uh, take, for example, Iraqi war injuries. They're, they're, this is like, a, here's data being thrown at us over 10 years, kind of in the newspaper and out the next day. Luke took it and created a symphony. So this is, he took, the first thing he did was an active open data. He found how many civilians and Americans and insurgents were injured for every day over like 10 years, and then created a string quartet. And what you're listening to is every measure, the number of notes, the number of injuries that day. When you go into a gallery and you present this thing, it can be incredibly powerful because you realize you're actually listening to, you know, to, a, to a real human issue. Uh, I kind of began the talk by, by or I, I talked kind of a bit about the enlightenment, about these changes that came through. There's a saying in the software world that architecture is destiny. So, it's not an accident that the internet's open. Networks don't have to be open. It was designed that way. And the same thing's going to be true with how we use and protect data. Our future lives are going to be a function of how this stuff is designed. So how one applies, for example, the ideas of the Enlightenment to the real world is a similar thing. When the US got started, because the US was this product, it had this idea of freedom and openness, it turns out it wasn't that easy, similar to what we're going through now, even in the data world. Uh, when the USA was launched as a product, we had kind of a great white paper, a vision document, the Declaration of Independence. That didn't actually tell you how to run the place, but it got things started. Version one of the United States was something called the Articles of Confederation. Before we had the Constitution, this is how you ran the United States, and it didn't work too well. The states were fighting with each other, the rules really weren't in place, and so a bunch of coders got together and had to write the Constitution. And that is actually what got things right, right? They saw what didn't work, and they then drafted this deep code that says, here's how the states will work together, here's how power will distribute it. And it turns out that was a pretty enduring document. And the guy who did a lot of the hard work was James Madison. We're at a similar point now, which is we kind of understand what we're trying to accomplish. We have some of the parameters, this code to be written, there's work to be done. There is kind of the information world's equivalent of getting that constitution right, which is working out the tough stuff that's, uh, uh, um, American democracy was called an invitation to struggle, because it is tough work. So there'll be a bunch of all-nighters and tough development work to make a just, great, big data world. And that work is gonna be done by a lot of you, kind of as well as the global community that's working on all this stuff. Thank you. Uh, Melton. Juliet is uh, inspired by the potential of design research 
to bridge scales of human understanding from micro to macro. Juliet is some ideal. Uh, is from IDEO uh, and has work, her work has spanned industries. She focuses on the relationship between humans and technologies. Uh, you have a bachelor's from Singapore, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a master's from, from Harvard. Welcome. Thank you. I'm mirroring the screen for you. journey, right? This is the data journey. And at IDEO, this is a framework that to us is really the key to unlocking creative confidence with data. So if you've worked with numbers, um, whether figuring out what numbers to use, deriving meaning from numbers, building businesses based off of that direct <coughs> meaning, um, you've probably encountered it, even if you might not have used the same terms that we're going to be talking about today. So I'll walk through this journey and share the meaning of each step along the way. And But, but really the foundation is this, right? That data comes from somewhere. And human choices determine what we measure, how we make sense of it, and then how we make value and meaning from what we understand. So thinking about data as a journey, as a process, allows us to unpack the steps required to make meaning from the data, and helps us get more relevant data, and helps us make more relevance of the data we have. So I'm going to keep digging into this. So the first step in this journey is collection. Data comes from somewhere. Right. The data journey starts with collecting figures, and the, the question of like what gets measured and why it gets measured, those are design decisions. Those are human decisions, and those help like without having like relevant numbers in the first place, you're not going to have any meaning off of the data that that results. So when I talk about collection, I mean I mean everything here from what types of sensors are we incorporating into buildings that we incorporate into building management systems. It means how do we ask survey questions so we get actually insightful responses from um, people who are responding to the survey. And here we're really thinking about, in this step, what problems are our clients trying to solve? And how can we best collect relevant data to inspire and inform? So now we have some numbers, and now they go somewhere. So next, the step is called management. So as data is collected, it's stored. Ideally, it's stored in a way that's secure and shareable. I mean, this step is everything from Excel to do, you know, and everything in between. But for the purposes of this conversation, I mean, like, this doesn't seem like a place where you call in a design firm, typically, right? But interestingly, a lot of the problems involved in this step are really organizational design. It's understanding who are the stakeholders, who are all the people who need to use this data, how are they getting the data to each other, right? And if you if you don't understand who these people are and what this is 
systems are, like what the systems need to be doing, you can't design a technical solution that's going to work. You have to understand the people behind this and what they need to get out of it. So next comes analyze, and this is really the heart of the process, right? I mean, this is where um, where we're looking for patterns and connections that lead to insight. You know, this is where you're doing regression analysis, for example, right? I mean, this is where you're really like in the numbers looking for meaning. But sometimes that, that meaning reveals itself through statistical analysis, and sometimes you have to kind of know some context in order to get in and ask the right questions. So knowing the question to ask a data set it requires understanding the domain and the context in which the data is gathered. So human-centered research can really help support this process. And, and there's a nice quote about this. An IDEO designer told me that, quote, understanding our client's business helps us look for correlations in the data that someone unfamiliar with their real goals wouldn't have known. So there's a really nice way here for people to come together and collaborate in this step. And knowing, first of all, like what questions should we be asking and knowing how to make sense from the data to be able to answer those questions. And the next step is synthesis, which often works with analysis as a sort of cyclical process. So synthesis is where human stories come into the mix. So often this is the part where we might be doing qualitative research, where we're talking to people, we're uncovering stories about them, we're really understanding Often what can happen in that process is as we, we learn a story about someone, we hear something and we think that's interesting. Who else has experienced that? Like, is that a pattern or is this an anecdote? We can go back into the data and look and understand if that's a pattern or if that's an anecdote. And you can drive really rich meaning for being able to, from going back and forth between um, synthesis and analysis. So next we come to expression. So this is really, it's the end of the journey, um, and it's where we express the, the story and the meaning to other people, and this sometimes manifests as information and visualization. Um, other times, it's like, it's a new product or service that derives value from the meaning of synthesized data. So this is the story of data. I'm sure um, it's like, you might have some like aha moments like, oh yeah, that's what I do. Like I might not have used those words, but that's actually what I do. Um, but for us, there's also another layer where, which we think makes data even richer, um, stories it tells, truer, and the insights it's, it enables like even more valuable. And, um, and this is the layer of human values. And uh, applying a values-based approach to the data journey lets us do more. So, at, at, at IDEA, we like to frame questions with the, the form, how might we? You, you see a lot of post-its around the office that just say, HMW dot dot dot, right? It's a very common way that we start to um, and encourage generative thinking and really think about, um, in a very open way, um, how to solve something. So let's think about the how might we statements that would correspond to the steps of the, design of the, the data journey framework. So, how might we, in the collection phase, help our clients understand what to measure and how to measure it? At Manage, how might we help our clients support the data management practices and build organizational structures that allow data to thrive? For analysis, how might we use human-centered insights to ask the right questions of data? For synthesize, we ask, how might we pull together stories and numbers to make meaningful insights? For express, how might we tell stories in a way that brings value to our clients and our stakeholders? For me, uh, seeing the data journey framework through the lens of these how might we statements is incredibly useful. This does so many things for us right here. Like what it, what it does is it makes having conversations about data much easier. It really opens up the process. It allows many more ways to get involved and it allows space for more people to feel like they have a place in the journey. And by helping these conversations and helping us being able to dig into the clients, it also helps kind of alleviate the sense sometimes of like insecurity and guilt when it comes to, to data. I, I, I feel like a lot of people feel like they don't know enough, they don't have the right technical background to be able to really have a say in this world, and I don't think that's true at all. Like, I, I think that not only is there space for all of us in this journey, but we have a responsibility to be here. Because as Peter was showing, like, this is, this is our world, like we are living in an increasingly quantitative world, and if we don't all get involved in making human, like, human centered meaning to it, like we're really losing out, and we're, we're losing that opportunity for ourselves and for everyone else too. 
So let's see this in action. Like how, mm -hmm. how does this manifest? And I wanted to talk about a, a couple of quick stories. This first one is about fish. So we are um, we are in the collect and manage phase of the story here. And the you know how might we start statements again for collect and manage? How might we help our clients understand what to, me what to measure and how to measure it? How might we help our clients support good data management practices? So this is a project that we did very recently for um, a funding agency. We wanted to improve populations of fish on the west coast. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of regulations about fisheries on the west coast. And a lot of people have a vested interest in understanding what's happening there. So you think about people who are uh, you think about fishermen, you think about people who uh, distribute the fish that are caught, you think about consumers, but then you also think about all the regulatory agencies that are making sure that fish populations stay healthy. Um, a lot of people care. And so like, where does the data come from about fishing? Well, it turns out that that comes from um, observers. So every fishing boat that goes out has a person on that boat whose job is to count fish. They are on that boat. Every fish that comes out of the water, they are counting, right? Every fish that looks like it's part of the, a member of a, a somewhat endangered species, they are really looking at that fish. They're counting how many spines it has, they're recording that. They're taking samples of its eardrum. Every single endangered fish they're sampling its eardrum. So they can mail that off to somebody who uses that to figure out how old that fish was at the time it was caught. So you can imagine if you have a piece of paper and you're standing on a fish, fishing boat and you're writing on this with a pen, this is going to be a really gross piece of paper, right? So this is a piece of paper covered in like fish guts, right? They get off the boat and now they put this in the mail and they send it to someone who looks over the piece of paper, types out all these figures, they put all this into a database, and they send the fish gut paper off to somebody else. Now the next person gets this data, and they look at the figures in the database, and they compare it, and they make sure that it all stacks up. And then a lot of other people now access the data in the database. So they pull it down to their machines, load it into Excel, and they have their copies of this data that they're making meaning from, and they're making policy decisions based on, and they have invested in so now you can imagine all of these different versions of this data floating around. And I didn't even, like, it even gets more complicated than that, but I didn't want to, to, to stress you out with that. Um, so this is a system map. This shows all of the stakeholders involved in fishery data on the West Coast. There are a lot of people on this, and it's very complicated. Every circle that you see represents a type of person, a type of role. So, you know, fishermen, um, shore side monitors and buyers, um, at sea observers, all these guys are up here and every line that you see is data flowing between these. So this is where the data is flowing, this is where the data is moving. And can you imagine designing a system for managing data if you didn't notice, right? Like if you just decided, like if, if you wanted to help people like move the data around and keep it secure, but you didn't know this, you would not succeed. And the only way that you could know this is by being on the boat, by being with the guy with the fish gut paper, by, by being on the dock, by being in the warehouse, by being in the office. So you really have to understand like, like where people's interests are, what they need, and, and, and how their role fits into everybody else's role. Or else you're not going to be able to solve problems for them. So again, these are human problems. They are technology problems, but they're also at their core human problems. Let's talk about shopping. From uh, collection and management at one end of the journey, now we're down at synthesize and express. So let's let's remember what those how might we statements are for synthesize and express. They are how might we pull together stories and numbers to make meaningful insights? How might we tell stories in a way that brings value to our clients? So eBay came to idea with a problem, and that the eBay team felt like they didn't have a complete picture of their customer base. They have a lot of data, right? I mean, they had data of like every single customer interaction with the site ever, right? So they had that. And they also had just done a big study and they had 50,000 survey responses. And all those survey responses were stacked up in 27 different Excel workbooks. And they, they, they really wanted to be human-centered, right? I mean, they had a set of personas that they had of, of their customer base, but it wasn't quite enough for them to strategically connect and make choices about their consumers and what their consumers really wanted. So, the challenge for IDEO was to distill all of the data collected and present it to eBay employees in a really humanized and, and engaged way 
so they could find out more about who their customers and make better choices for them. And so what the IDEO team did is, uh, through all of this data, they, they, they drilled down, right? Like they went through the analysis and synthesis process over and over and over again, and they pulled out 50 people who they wanted to talk to them. And they went to their homes, right? They were in their garages, they were taking pictures of all their shoes and their, and their closets, they were recording interviews with them, like really getting to know them and understand what their lives were like and how eBay was a part of their life and what it meant to them and what they needed from it, right? And they came back and they brought those stories, the photos and the videos together with the data, right? And they showed, here's this person and we talked to her in Chicago and she cares about shoes and this is how she finds them. And there are all these other people who feel the same way, right? Like this is a really representative segment of our population and this uh, combination of stories and numbers brought together helped the eBay team like have confidence, right? It helped them have an approach that was strategic, that was heartfelt, and, and also was good for their brain. Like they really had confidence in this data and they could move forward. And so this this app has been shared with eBay employees across the world and they're using it to really like help them make choices. And I feel like a lot of this really comes down to that, right? Like how do we make good choices? And unfortunately I think a lot of ways in which we kind of show data like don't quite get us to that point. And I think that's a really interesting strategic place is how do we pull things together, show them and share them in a way that we can make a good decision together based off of that. So this is the journey and I think it's helpful. I mean, I found it to be really, really helpful for my work and, and hopefully you do too. And I hope that, it's, that like through these how might we statements, more people feel the confidence to engage with the data journey once they understand how human centered it really can be and how we can all do more and do better data. What, what we'll do is take a few questions, maybe Peter and, and Juliet, if, if you can join me. Or should we have another microphone? Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Peter. So, so let's maybe uh, I'll, I'll kind of throw the first question and let's sort of get it started. Okay. So, so uh, question for both of you. So, we hear a lot about sort of massive data growth. We hear about sometimes doubling of data during a couple of years and all. Is this primarily coming from new sensors? Is it coming from cell phones? Is it coming from dark data, data that was always there but never <laughs> captured? Where is it coming from? I think the fastest growing thing on Earth is all this machine to machine stuff. Mm -hmm. So the internet had something like 50 million users. Is this on? No. no. <coughs> Hello? Oh, that's better. Okay. 1995, there are 50 million internet users. And as you know, two years ago, we ran through the IP4 addresses. So that was about 4.6 billion, and now people are predicting a trillion connected Internet of Things devices in, what, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So the fastest growing thing on Earth would be data coming from things. And, and of course, humans don't grow that quickly. So I think, it, to me, that's where the growth is coming from. And it, it, it also is like the fastest, I don't know anything in business that has that kind of growth. So I think that it strikes me that it, it's that. Inherently physical things with, which are producing lots of data with digital interfaces. Is that what you mean? Well, it's also, it's also the kind of any of the data about our world. So it's our location and it's all the metadata about us. But I mean, what's interesting is it's stuff that humans produce. So tweets or stuff that we write or stuff that we consciously author, which is what like an awful lot of stuff was until, you know, that was what the first growth was, doesn't grow nearly as quickly. There was a, there's a slide, I didn't put the slide in, but kind of when you show these, the, the uh, amount of connected devices in 1995, if that was the moon, and um, the Earth would have been like what we just went through, and in 15 years it's Jupiter. It was like five orders of magnitude. And, and how, how do you think of sort of, you know, the cell phone, the mobile phone, relative to other sort of wearable devices, you know, like let's say you're in your car, there's, there's various sort of devices in the car that are sending data, 
because the phone is with you all the time. It's capturing lots of click stream data. Yeah. It has um, other sensors. How, how do you think about the phone? You know, it's, it's interesting because the if you talk to car manufacturers, they are really thinking about the phone and how that will become part of the car ecosystem as well. So we're looking at how all these systems start to fit in together. If you look at building management systems, now the phone starts to become part of that too. So I think that like the phone is, or you know, which is funny, we call it even a, a phone, right? It's like our, our personal device um, becomes sort of a key in how we connect with all of these other ecosystems that are rapidly developing. And I think it will see, especially the rise in smart buildings, happening quite a lot over the next few years. And it'll be interesting to see how smart buildings and sensors in them will start to talk to our devices and eventually our sensors and how this works. The politics of all this is really interesting. So, um, you know, the cell phone, the, the, the network operators thought this is great, we're sitting on all of this data. But it turns out the most interesting stuff is being gathered by the devices. So when you think about those low power chips that were announced that, that, that the, the Moto phone has, and now that it was announced this week for the, for the Apple phone. Um, that's a huge amount of real-time, always-on stuff that the manufacturers have access to. And if you look at the, um, the latest Motorola phone, all of that real-time stuff sits inside Google's own firewall. There are no APIs, only they get to look at it. And so that's a, that creates a huge amount of power, I think, for the person that has access to the data in that device, which, you know, the, Operators have been disintermediated, and it's now people like Apple and, and Google. Like you mentioned, um, building smart buildings, and uh, let's take kind of the connected home. You know, you have a lot of different stakeholders that you yeah. have cable companies, you have phone companies, you have security companies <coughs> like ADT, you have phone companies like Apple and Samsung. Who, who do you think is, is going to sort of enable the applications? Who's going to be sort of that uh, that uh, uh, IT uh, the kind of the app store who's going to enable the applications? I don't know. I mean, I I, I have a hunch that um, I think I, I think Nest is going to do some really interesting things. I mean, depending on starting from that end of it, right? Like like they are actively working on building a platform for the home, starting with the thermostat stuff and working out from there. I mean, if you're if you're thinking about how the home is kind of regulating itself. If you're thinking about home as entertainment, I don't know. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Right? Both home and quantified self have this problem that huge proliferation of manufacturers. Everybody has their own silo. Everybody wants to be a data company and not just a hardware company. So nobody's cooperating early on, and yet we know how that movie's supposed to play out. Very much like what happened with ATMs. When ATM machines first came out, everybody had their own, and then there was more value in having a network. And then, you know, it, Right, so then the question of who's going to win will it be an incumbent like Apple, will Nest pull it off? Clearly, you know, there's there's a need for aggregation, and as consumers, we'd like everyone to have an API and and, and play nice. But you know, then, then you get into like who you who you place the bets on. Um, I the people with the big ecosystems plus maybe a couple of well-funded companies. And, and clearly, you know, there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of devices. Yeah. And so the right. device renters are going to fight their own battles, but to some extent, the, there's a whole different value created on the back end that's what you're pointing out. So let's, let's um, go to a question. Let's take the question in the back. Go ahead. If you can speak loud, yes. So um, I, I was drawn to this event because it was tied to the human values, how they're affected and how big data impacts. That was a different topic than so many other events that are happening in Silicon Valley, also discussing big data. And with Peter being here, who has spoken at the United Nations, and United Nations being in session as we are, you know, assembling here, I was, I could not help reading President Dilma Rousseff of uh, Brazil's speech to the United Nations. And her criticism of the United States, the way NSA spy on her and on, on her business on, and on Brazil's businesses and took away some very valuable information. This was her allegation. I'm not saying it is true. I'm not saying it is false. She also canceled her state dinner at the White House. To me, that was quite a 
big. Boom. Being here in the United States and being an American, I feel proud that most of the companies who are participating in this are American. It's a great moment. But it also creates an opportunity and an issue that we could sort of create those values or, or actually kill those values for which we have fought for a long time. That is segregation and apartheid against humans, creating classes of society where certain people, certain vested interests, certain privileged class have the control over the entire generations, the entire middle class, and that includes us. So my hope was, and I request both of you, that when you are speaking on values, human values, and how uh, big data impacts those, you should be uh, brave and confident to discuss those issues and bring them to the knowledge of Africa. Thank you. You bring so, up. Let me just repeat the question for you. Yeah. Three. It's a long <laughs> yeah. statement, but but uh, um, maybe it's hard to repeat. I, I heard I heard three <laughs> things. I mean, what, what, one of your big issues was um, the U.S. now caught listening in other societies. This challenges our fundamental openness. Um, it, it kind of puts us in opposition with other countries. And you brought up Brazil as an example. That was an issue. This, it's actually a human value. It is. No, I completely agree. This is a fundamental. An, as a nation kind of founded, nation are we? as a nation founded on values, yeah. this is a very tough issue, right? And it's um, uh, we're supposed to be a beacon for openness to the world. Look, the United States kind of plays this both ways. It goes to the ITU and it says we need openness, and it's not good that you, you know, Russia and China have closed internets. Then we come back here and we do very different actions. They look inconsistent especially when they're being sunshine. So that's a, it's a very big issue. It's also a big economic issue for us because American manufacturers, um, if the rest of the world believes they're back doors and all of our stuff, and if you put a data center here, someone else is listening, you know, that's better for Belgium or Iceland, but not us, right? So that's a very serious economic development issue. Um, the second issue you brought up is really one of, of big data for whom and can it be used against us? So on the one hand, hey, it opens things up and we can all participate. But for example, I think it was in I think it was in Brazil, but one of the developing countries, they opened up housing data, and then real estate interests were able to aggregate property and really hurt people who were disadvantaged. Right. So this stuff is really powerful stuff. And, and what does that mean? It means that we all have a big stake in getting educated about it. It means that we that uh, this is why I, I think that like civics classes should become hackathons. Everyone has to have a, a literacy with data. We have to push that stuff out. Um, it needs to be a very healthy national debate. It's the reason that I'm worried, like my friend Rajiv doing public health stuff, he actually gets onto something good, but okay, that really lovely innovation thing we like gets hurt. It's a fragile time. I mean, it really is. These are, these are fundamental, powerful things. And when I said it before, you know, like architecture's destiny, there is no technological determinism. It's not like networks were open and the internet happened. It's like, Bob Kahn and, and Vince Cerf designed it that way because they had a very particular set of values in mind. And we're at that same point again. I just want to make one brief comment. I fully understand and appreciate the atmosphere of the area. It's a post 9 11 world, and there is a lot of, you know, there, there's a great deal of need in, for the intelligence and law enforcement community, not just here. Having said that, I also believe that it is important that we preserve the interests of both. Otherwise, we have to, if, if we go in either direction, you know, only in one direction, then we are failing as a, as a, a you know, as, as a society. Thank you. Let's, let's, there's another question here. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I sort of work as a user researcher right now, and there's a sort of quote that's often quoted about um, Henry Ford asking the public what he wanted um, for, for cars, and the answer was faster horses. So my question to you is um, sort of, when you sort of do your ethnography studies on collecting data of groups of people, <coughs> how do you figure out what's true data versus sort of fabricated data with biases? 
Uh, I think that comes down to asking the right questions and paying attention. So, you know, it's about really uh, like understanding people's needs. So, how are they actively solving problems right now? Um, what kind of problems are they having in their in their lives? And um, and that's where some of like the kind of deep ethnographic work really comes in handy by by being there in person and seeing like um, really what's hard for them right now. And when we ask them, like, when we do what's called co-creation with someone, um, we sometimes ask them, like, what would this interface look like for you, for example? And it's not that we want them to design that interface for us, but we use that as a jumping off point to figure out what their real needs are. Oh, so why is that button there, right? Um, why is, what would that screen show? And that's a way to unpack, like, what they really want from that experience, and then we can go in and, and design that. Question in the back. Yeah, yes. I'm just going to follow up uh, on the point you made. After the, the banking failure of a few years ago, when everyone wondered, you know, and everyone still wonders out loud, is the system rigged? You know, seems like it is. Um, I think people are trying to ask the same about the data collection society. Is it rigged in favor of Google and of Facebook and of private interests? And, you know, that's part of the same question, but. I guess the, the, the question, the, the real question is, um, will will the technology be able to uh, protect democracy, to protect user choice, to protect privacy? It, it doesn't look too good from where I'm sitting, but you know, I'd like to hear your your uh, response to that. The um, the point I was making at the end about the, the work that has to be done is exactly that. There is this begin and this, this was the point I was making about feudalism versus the enlightenment, right? There's now a realization that the way it's been, which is I belong to a whole bunch of services and the company has my data and then like I can like whack a mole, try to go turn off cookies or turn something off, but that's not very sustainable. And in any event if I choose to withdraw from that economy, I don't you know like there's no email or anything. Like there's a realization that paradigm has to come to an end. And in fact, there needs to be something where your data is secure, trusted yours, and then you make some deal to lease it back. That, and that, and so people are working on that. Like that group from MIT is doing really interesting work on it. And I think that's some of the most interesting stuff going on in the Valley. That's a tough problem, right? Because it's a big architectural thing. It involves code. It needs the whole system to get adopted. And conceptually, it seems from where we're sitting almost ridiculous. Like how would that work? Um, but that's the reason it's so important, because if like if we don't get something like that going, then it's just more of the same. But I th if the good news from a democracy point of view is people are getting pretty pissed about this. It's like, um, really, who would have thought data was in the cover every day? You know, like you know between the Snowden stuff and the corporate stuff, it's like it, it, regulators know this is a really big deal, and it now demands kind of a legal and a technical response. Like literally, it's about product development and ways of building an ecosystem that looks like an alternative. So if that doesn't work, I'm not optimistic. And it may be a techno-optimist in me believes that we're going to like develop ourselves out of it, but that's kind of, I think, where we're at. I think, I guess, because of the kind of the trend of questions, I guess people are asking, we're in very early stages of the development of big data uh, approaches, technologies. Is this, is this uh, like a weapon, is this like, nuclear weapon or something like that, where it, it can be so um, dangerous in the use and control of other people in a bad way that we should, maybe this is not a direction we want to take. So, wow, that's a tricky one. I mean, I, I, I don't see that happening. I mean, I, I don't see us doing like a data non-proliferation program, right? Like, okay, we're, we're going to stop doing this now. I think that enough people are finding enough real value in it, and it's doing enough really good things that that I, I don't see us stopping. Um, but I do think it's important for people to become literate and understand what's happening and um, fight for it to become more open. I mean, it's a big shift. But look at the Industrial Revolution, right? The Industrial Revolution happens, and then there are all these bad unintended consequences and you know uh, you know and then and then you make 
then you figure out how to adapt to that stuff. And I mean, we could we could go on and on, but I mean, that's that's a, I think a pretty good analogy, right? Because uh, and, and the other thing you found is there was a big dehumanizing aspect of that, right? It's like you didn't realize that what it, would, it was a race to the bottom in terms of crap jobs and stuff like that. And there's a race to the bottom going on now. Uh, you know, the fact that the world is flat, the fact that, uh, you know, take the Uber drivers whose job was made possible because Uber created that fluidity, then they started protesting because they realized that their ratings, you know, like whether you get a a job or not is like what the audience, how they rate you. Well, we have 100 years of labor law and you know HR departments and all these things that put some sort of values between the crowd and you. And now with crowdsource stuff, it's entirely up to some private company whether it's fair and how it works. So whole parts of your society that work through government and regulating things have been routed around right around the time that like nobody likes government anyway. So it's going to it's going to hurt for a while. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, the great media theorist who wrote Understanding Media and talked about the medium as the message, um, wrote a book called War and Peace in the Age of Global Information. And he said, when this hits, when we all know each other, he coined the word global village, we'll all know each other's business. It'll be kind of painful. We may have a very long kind of period of information wars because when you know everybody's business, um, you become a tribe again. He talked about retribalizing, like in a tribe before the, industry, before the book. Everybody knew everybody's business. There wasn't privacy. And we rule by shame. Since I knew everything that was going on, you kind of live guilty and someone would know what's going on. We're going back to that. That's what he's saying we're retribalizing. And his point was it wasn't all from by our tribes fought. So this exercise is something in the nature of being human that's powerful and that since the technology is here, we have to willfully deal with. You mentioned sort of industrial revolution. You think of sort of this data revolution as sort of of the same sort of magnitude, the same impact? Um, looks that way, right? I mean, it's, look, just economically, look at the kind of efficient, you see this, and this is the business unit, right? If you just look at the, uh, you throw big data at something and you often see an order of magnitude improvement. I mean, that's like ridiculous, right? So, I mean, that's, I think it's that scale of stuff and we're just at the beginning. I mean, this, I go back to that goofy number I used at the beginning, which is, okay, there'll be 50 trillion connected things. So to me, the fact that everything will be measurable, that's very Darwinian, right? You know, the inefficiencies in everything, you know, you can measure the, the output of everybody. Um, so it, it can pull for something dehumanizing, and yet at the same time, um, you know, there's a portion of this that lets people get engaged, lets people do new forms of storytelling. That's why I think the art part of the side. There's the whole other side of this that we have to push and explore. Which you do with a design world. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, but yeah, I really see that shift. In, in terms of um, new kinds of, of jobs also, like, like, the way, like jobs that we didn't have words before, um, and I can see this really interesting shift in how we're thinking of ourselves as individuals, how we're thinking of ourselves as like, connected economic units. I mean, like something is something really big is happening, and, and I think we are seeing this. And I and I do think having that human perspective here at this point really matters. Yeah, you know, it's quite possible that if we couldn't instrument everything and build things like smart grids and improve our cities, that you know our goose would be cooked. So, <laughs> right. Uh, the lady there. Uh, how do we test the integrity of our data in both a global sense and also from a user design um, research sense um, when we bring our predisposition to bias um, into the equation? I think there's always bias, right? I mean, like, like these are human systems, and humans have, have, have bias, and I think it's um, part of that is just ha being mindful of our bias and understanding what we bring to it and trying to help, like, we, in we inform ourselves as much as possible so that our, our bias is reduced or um, that, we're, that we're aware of it. And I think that's part of where the, um, like, really doing research comes in, right? Like, really understanding other people's needs and how they're approaching it so that you, you don't only have your bias, like, you have all of their biases too, right? And once you have everybody's biases in, then it gets a little more fair. But I don't, I don't think there's a way around that. Let's take two more questions. Go ahead. Well, you know, I understand the point, and I like the point of bias. I, I think it's 
a bit blue-eyed, though, in, in the sense that the bias, you know, if you, if you want to find something, then the bias really becomes a very important part and it actually can influence the data collection. I mean, let's think about, you know, weapons of mass destruction, um, destructions being found in Iraq. You know, if you really want to find it, you will find it, even though it's not there. So I think there is a danger in, in that we bias our own data collection. To your point, to it before, I, I like that, you know, there is an element that, that I think we need to understand about the collection of the data as well, because that influences a lot. The way that Google collects, you know, the, the great suggestions in Google search, with a case in Germany where I think the wife of uh, the, uh, the, the president, you know, she was affiliated with some, um, I think, or houses or whatever, and since a lot of people searched for it, it became a bias within the Google search, so her name always appeared in conjunction with this whorehouse. And she tried to sue Google, and Google said, no, 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 that's, that's not our problem. But this is where I think that the individualization of the big data actually can become a problem because it can influence you know, a whole new set of data. And I mean, you know, for, for the 20th century, information was always important, and probably more important than anything was misinformation. You know, I mean, Nazi Germany, planting information in the right way can bring us to do anything. So I think there is a, a very big problem with having that hypothesis bias that we have in data collection. Um, so I, I guess the last question, but um, so, you know, a lot of the big data, there's a lot of downsides to it. I was wondering if you guys uh, had any examples of data, big data being used by not companies or not governments, which are kind of like large companies, but rather um, on our behalf, supposedly, but um, you know, to, uh, for citizens to be empowered. So for example, I understand there's a company in San Francisco called uh, Castlight, I think. They're using um, big data from insurance payments and so on to figure out how much insurance companies are paying uh, medical providers because all that information is caught up in NDAs and contracts that are totally secret. So now this is casting light, uh, like you said earlier, um, on hidden data that is, has been very private. And in, you can argue that that's good for uh, the healthcare system in general. Are there other examples that you could discuss that um, are empowering the citizens to do things that um, maybe are not so good for companies, but are good for us as a society? I mean, I think a lot of the early stuff does that. There are any of the travel services that do predictive pricing on what fares will be and then help you bring prices down are good examples of that. You could argue that a lot of the sharing economy does that because it lets us take some asset, whether it's you know, a car or a house, or whatever, and, 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 and get more out of that. A lot, a lot of the stuff going on in cities, as data's opened up, are kind of citizens groups that are building things kind of to open up and expose processes in cities. So I, um, but I mean, some of that stuff also cuts both ways, right? You know, you can look at Airbnb, which, you know, helps you monetize your house, but then that also uh, ha has a net effect of increasing rents because now a landlord might say, I can use that more efficiently. So there's always a, an interesting second order effect, but there are plenty of good cases where this stuff is, uh, you know, hugely pro consumer. Very good. I deeply appreciate uh, your presence, Peter and Juliet, and thank you all for joining today.